All right, so let's get started. Um, so uh, I'm Marga, as Lexi said, uh, I'm a staff software engineer at Kimfolk. I work in the Flatcar Container Linux product, which is one of our open source products. Before working at Kingfolk, I was a site reliability engineer at Google for almost eight years. So reliability is a very important theme for me and I've learned to uh, make it part of my life. And uh, I moved from working at a big tech company where there were like teams of engineers that were working on reliability to working at a small company where everyone is wearing many different hats. So we have uh, very few people and we need to uh, get things done with the small team. And so some days I'm a software engineer and I'm developing software. Other days I'm a test engineer and I'm writing tests. And other days I'm a reliability engineer and I'm focusing on reliability. And so this talk is for people that are in that position. So it's not for Google employees who have like huge teams, but rather people that are trying to balance a lot of different balls um, at the same time and still care about reliability. Uh, so let's start by saying, like explaining what reliability is, right? Because this talk is about reliability, we need to be uh, in agreement <laughs> what it means. So if you look this up uh, on the web, you will see that it says that it's the quality of being trustworthy or of performing consistently, consistently well. Uh, and so, yeah, okay, so this is what the dictionary says, but what does it mean when we move this on to like cloud applications? In the context of cloud applications, we will care about some specific uh, features of our application, like availability, which is like if our users can reach the site or not. If we have like a super cool website or app or whatever, and half of the time our users can outreach it, they will move on to a different application when that is actually reachable, even if it's less fancy or less cool. And, and similarly with the other measurements. So like we want our site to be fast. If, if we have like a, a great application that does everything perfectly, but it's super slow, users will go away. Or if it's super fast, but it gives you the wrong answer, <laughs> it's not useful. And uh, reliability is also about data safety. So we also care about like, doing the right things with our users' data, having backups, et cetera. All of that is included. And these are the generic themes, right? And depending on uh, what your application, your service does, you will maybe care about other things as well, not just about these four. Uh, and, and that's all right, uh, because like there's a wide range of things that you may care about. Uh, these are just, um, basic examples. But there's a, there's a theme in all of this, which is that uh, if, if our application is not reliable, users will go away. <laughs> so this is why reliability matters. If an application is not reliable, users move on to a different one. So maybe it's not so much fun to develop reliability into our applications, but it's something that lets us keep our users and an application without users is not relevant. So uh, so we need to uh, make it reliable. So all of this seems pretty obvious. So why are we even talking about this? Like, isn't it like super clear that everything needs to be reliable? The problem is that there's a conflict of incentives. When, when I'm writing software, when I'm developing features, I get like this uh, rash of developing something and then seeing it in action and it works and it's great, right? And if, if you're a programmer, you've, you've experienced this thing where like you have an idea, you write the code and then it works and it's so much fun. And of course, when you're a software developer, you want to do this all the time, right? You want to create new features, launch a new version, make your application do some new cool thing and and do this as fast as possible. Maybe you have like a weekly sprint or two week sprint, whatever, and you want to keep releasing new features. 
uh, and this is all nice, but then the other side of the coin is the person who's maintaining the software and who's keeping the software running who can who can be you right it's like it can be you on a different time of the day uh and so when you're trying to keep the system running you don't want to have any outages you don't want to have any headaches you don't want to do any firefighting and the more changes you introduce the more chances there are of an outage and so here's where the conflict of incentives comes so if you if you want to release features as fast as possible you will cause outages if you want to have as few outages as possible you will not release features and so there's this conflict of features or no features and and this is where the 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 principles that i want to share about reliability come to help us to to find the right balance uh in this conflict so how, how do we do that uh the first step is going to be measuring how our application is doing because if we don't have data if we don't know how our application is behaving if it's behaving well or badly then we can't do anything. So how do we get the data? We get it through monitoring. So in the cloud context, I say monitoring and you probably hear Prometheus uh, and that's fine. That's a tool and it's a valid tool. But in this talk, I'm not talking about Prometheus in particular, but rather about the concept of monitoring. And the tool that you use depends on your infrastructure, your other needs, you could, as well use like Google Analytics for getting the, the information that you need. So as long as you get the information that you need, it's fine. There's no like blessed tool that is the thing to use. The important thing is the metrics, right? The, the important thing is getting the metrics that matter for your service or your application. And you, you want really to be the ones that matter for your application. So whatever system you're using might come with a set of default metrics and those default metrics might or might not serve a good purpose for you so if you're if you're maintaining a website you probably do care about the error 500s that your website is serving right you probably do care that those are low it depends on what your website does but probably you care about that and most monitoring applications might make it easy for you to expose that. But there are other things that you might care more about. Like if you, if you have users that subscribe to your website, you might care more to see that the, the subscription workflow is working correctly. Or if you are selling stuff, you might care that the latency of purchases is, is very low. Or if your website is about like meme creation, you might care that memes are created. If they are not created, it means something is wrong. So you really need to focus on finding what are the metrics that are specific to your service or application. And the, <clears throat> sorry, the other thing is it's not just enough to measure from the inside. So like what your service is seeing, but you also want to measure from the outside because your service could be serving like an awesome website, but if nobody can reach it, then it's not useful. So that's what provers are for, which you can run yourself or you can get a third party to run them for you. But uh, it's a way of measuring how your website is responding from the outside. And if, if your application is a global application that is reached by people from all over the world, um, you want to have proverbs that are also all over the world, not just in your country, because uh, you need to know, like, does it work for someone connecting from South Africa? Does it work for someone connecting from Brazil? It's, uh, if, if you're trying to reach a global audience, you need to check it globally. All right, so I've spoken a bit about monitoring. Let's assume now that we deployed our monitoring uh, infrastructure, we have a super cool dashboard, it has the right metrics. Uh, are we going to get someone to look at the dashboard all day? No, of course not. Looking at dashboards is very boring and uh, it's not a good use of anybody's time. So what we are going to do is to set up alerting.
And similarly to what I was saying with the metrics, with monitoring, when we set up alerting, we need to focus on uh, alerts that uh, matter. So if it's an alert for something that is not actionable, it's not useful. If uh, it just goes away on its own and you don't do anything, it's also not useful. We need to trigger alerts for events that require a human to intervene. Um, so the, the alerts can suffer from false positives and false negatives. False positives is when, when there's an alert and there's nothing to be done, right? Like uh, what I was just saying. Uh, either it went away on its own or it's actually not a problem. It's just a fact of life that that thing is happening. And the problem with those types of alerts is that they create alert fatigue that uh, people get used to ignoring them. So like if every day you get an alert saying that you are getting too many error 500s and then when you go to look at the system, it just went away and you don't know why, you start ignoring the alert. And then one day there's actually a problem, but because you were ignoring this alert all the time, you you just think, oh, okay, it's the same error of everything that I've always said that it will just go away on its own and it doesn't, right? So, so that's really bad. So that's why when we have an alert that is triggering, that is not useful, we need to fix it so that it gives us an actual signal. Either disable the alert or make it less sensitive or whatever, make it useful. And then false negatives are alerts that should have triggered but didn't. And they didn't and we had an outage and <laughs> everything broke, whatever, whatever our application was doing. Uh, users were unhappy and we didn't catch it in time because the alerts didn't trigger. So usually we, we realize that we have these false negatives after <laughs> when, when we have the outage. And it's important that we follow up and fix it, right? We add the alert that's missing. We add the metric that's missing uh, so that we don't have another outage for the same reason, which would be very embarrassing. All right. <clears throat> so we covered monitoring and alerting, but how does this help us solve the incentive conflict that I mentioned earlier? To help us solve that conflict, we need to introduce one other concept, which is service level objectives. Service level objectives are metrics that help us uh, assess the, how our service is behaving. So uh, it's important that they are metrics, so they are numbers. And we can say, for example, that our service is 99% of the time available. That's a typical SLO. Or we could focus on the latency. We can focus on the latency of each request or the 99th percentile of all requests, things like that. So we want to measure how our service is behaving and we measure it with these metrics. And then we set goals of how we want our service to behave. So let's, let's use availability because it's easy. And um, we can say, we want our service to be 99% of the time available, right? And so we can measure whether our service is available or not. And we can say whether we are achieving sorry. it or not. Yes, there's a sorry, question. Sorry. Yes, well, actually the monitoring slide is stuck. Okay, so I was talking about SLOs and metrics. And I was saying that the SLOs need to capture the user's expectations and the developer's expectations. So like if, you're, if our users expect our site to be up, uh, we need to fulfill that expectation, but also we need to let developers release features. So that's how they help us find this balance. And SLOs need to be achievable. So it, there's no use aiming so high that we can't achieve it because then it, they are not really providing any, any help. Okay, so let's look at how that actually works. And hopefully you can all now see a table. Yes? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, so it's working. Um, so 
this table helps us understand that this availability number that I was talking about, what it means uh, in regards to days or hours that our service can be down. So if we say our service can, uh, w that we want to have an SLO of 99% availability, that means that we can have 3.65 days a year that our service is down, right? And that's like over the course of a whole year. And if we look at it over the course of a month, it's 7.2 hours and over the course of a day is 14.4 minutes. Usually services don't go down per day, right? Usually you don't go down 14 minutes per day, but sometimes you have an outage, right? And so that's why you, you pick the window that makes the most sense for you. So say you picked per month, you, you have 7.2 hours per month that your service can be down, right? And uh, that's, that's for an availability of 99%. 7.2 hours can be a lot or can be very little. It depends on what your service does. So if you are a backend application that is used by a mobile app and the mobile app just reaches this backend application to get some updates, 7.2 hours a month, it's like, okay, during seven hours a month, you, your users didn't get the update, but they got it later, it's okay. But if you are developing a banking application and this 7.2 hours or 7.2 hours where your users were not able to reach their bank accounts, they probably are not very happy, right? So that's why we need to figure out the right metrics for our application. And uh, the perfectionist people like me may say, why don't we just aim for 100% reliability? Why 99%, 99.9, 99.99? Why can't it just be 100? Well, making it like uncrushable means spending a lot of money because you need to have a lot of redundant hardware just there in case the other one fails, spending a lot of time and effort and even then it's basically impossible to make it uncrushable. <laughs> so you can add more nines, but it's basically impossible to reach 100. And the question is, is it worth it, right? You can, you can get five nines of availability. Is it really worth it? For some applications it might be, but for most applications it's not. So, unless you are developing medical devices or aviation devices that really should be as reliable as possible, you probably want to aim a little bit lower, something that is high but achievable. And then how do you use this number? Here comes one of the most interesting concepts, which is error budgets. So this is how, how we uh, solve the conflict of incentives. When we have an error budget, let's say for a month, of our service being down for seven hours, right? We, we said we would aim for 99% availability, seven hours of downtime. And we can reach this target by never being down, of course, or maybe having one hour of outage one day, another hour of outage another day, and maybe three hours a day where the outage was really bad and it's still under seven hours. So we are reaching, we are inside this error budget. So what happens if we had like a terrible outage we couldn't recover from, or we are having outages every day, even if they are short and they add up to more than seven hours. That's when we say we reached our error budget. We don't have any more budget anymore. So we can't keep releasing new features and we need to spend time on reliability instead, right? And, and this is the, for me, this is the key concept that helps us uh, fix this problem of incentives. When, when we have so many problems that our application is no longer as reliable as we decided that it should be, that's when we need to stop and say, okay, no more features, we work on reliability until everything is working acceptably. And I'll say, okay, so, so what do we do? How, how do we fix that? So here is how, how we start mitigating the risks of uh, putting out 
features so that we reduce the chances that we will have an outage. We never can reduce it to zero, but we can reduce the chances so that we are stay within our error budgets. The first thing is testing infrastructure. And when I talk about testing, I'm not just thinking about unit tests or integration tests, which is what people uh, first thing when they talk about testing, but like a bigger uh, set of tools that are related to testing. Of course, you want good test coverage, but after that comes the more interesting things. So continuous integration is something that probably you've all heard about and it's very nice. And then push and green, which means releasing only the things that pass the test is also very nice. But a lot of people don't actually apply this or they give themselves a pass and then things start to turn badly. So if you have continuous integration and your tests always pass and are always green, everything's fine. But if you have flaky tests that sometimes pass and sometimes fail, or worse, tests that always fail and you've taught yourself to ignore these tests, whether they get flaky or always failing, but they are still part of the continuous integration. So you're no longer pushing on green, you are just clicking some override button or whatever to push a release that didn't pass all the tests, then you're basically ignoring all the testing infrastructure that you have. And it's very likely that you will make mistakes and release stuff that isn't good because you are ignoring the test. So having a good testing infrastructure implies not having flaky tests and not having tests that you just ignore because a failing test <laughs> needs to be actionable. Otherwise, your testing infrastructure is just wasting resources and it's not helping you. But on top of unit testing and integration testing, we also need to do other kinds of testing like load testing to check that our servers will be able to handle the load that we expect and even more than the load than we expect. It would be great if our application is super successful and then we need to have more load. So we need to check that we can actually do that and other things like fussing, like checking that our service can get weird inputs and it still works and it doesn't crash. Uh, of course, you want to do this not in production, but in your test servers, or at least don't start doing it in production, do it in your test servers first. <laughs> you don't want all your production servers to suddenly crash. Uh, so, release canaries is a strategy to test in production, but without actually breaking all of production. Uh, the name, the origin of the name of canaries comes from, it's a bit morbid, but it's useful to understand it, to know what we are talking about. It comes from the canaries that were used by coal, coal mine workers to know whether there was enough oxygen. So, what they did was have canaries, and if the canaries di died, they knew that they had to get out of there because there wasn't enough oxygen. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit sad for those old canaries. Fortunately, nowadays there's technology so they don't need to harm any more animals. Uh, but we, we kept this name uh, for uh, sacrificing some of our servers, some of our instances uh, with the new versions of our software and so we check whether it's working correctly or not by running it on a subset of the servers. And if we see that this new version is not working successfully, we roll back to the previous version and only a few users were affected. So this, this idea of, of having a subset allows us to also use less of our error budget because um, say, you deploy a new version to 10% of your instances. And this version was not working. And it took you one hour to realize that it wasn't working and roll back to the previous version. So you had a one hour outage, but it was only 10%. So instead of 60 minutes of your error budget, this actually it's six minutes of your error budget because only 10% of your users saw the problem. So it wasn't like a 100% outage. And so, but it's important that we use this uh, 
correctly by by checking. So we deploy to the new to the new instances, a new version, and we check that it's working correctly. And if it's not, we roll back, right? So rolling back is what saves us and what allows us to uh, go back to the, the previous working condition. Uh, what happened? <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I, uh, we rolled back the slide. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, and then if it's working correctly after some time, it depends on what it is that you are deploying, but usually it's, it's usual to wait for one day and then you deploy it to more instances. It could be just go from 10% to 100, but it could also be that you do a progressive rollout like the first day 1%, then 10%, then 25%, and then 100. It, it depends on how, how big or small the application the service is. All right, next slide. Um, yeah, and then another source of problems are the humans. So like if we are doing the canary thing, we need a human that, we may need a human that is pushing it to 1%, 10%, 25%, and then the human may make mistakes. So it's important to try to remove humans from the loop as much as possible. In other words, automate as much as possible. And this includes release automation, which is like the canary thing that I was talking about, but it also includes things like automatic rollbacks. This may sound kind of like black magic, but it might be possible to have your monitoring infrastructure detect that your service is now suddenly responding with a lot of 500s and this doesn't seem right, so let's roll back to the previous version. And of course, automatic backups and automatic everything because the, the more human interaction that we have in our processes, the more mistakes that will be made. We humans are not reliable at all. <laughs> all right, so let's say we have automated everything. Are we immune to outages? Of course not. There's always going to be outages. So let's move on <laughs> to dealing with outages. Yeah, so outages will happen. They are a fact of life. We can't deny it. And so what we need to do is be prepared. Next slide. Um, so how can we prepare ourselves for outages? The first step, the step zero, is to accept that outages will happen. Uh, even if we, we feel like they shouldn't, they will happen. And uh, once we accept that, we can prepare for them. Uh, so have playbooks for the most common problems. Playbooks are basically documentation of what to do when a problem occurs. So if, if we get an alert, what do we do with this alert? And you might think that it's very obvious what to do with the alert, but when you're under pressure, when like the system is down and, and the, the phone is ringing and why haven't you fixed it, uh, having a clear step-by-step -step, uh, process of what you need to do, even if it's obvious, it's really helpful. Um, also, I mentioned this already, but it's very important, so I'm repeating it. Uh, have this rollback first, fix later philosophy like engraved in your mind because it's very, very common for software developers to want to fix it in production and do a hot fix and you, you see the code and you are like, oh yeah, it's just a plus one is missing here. I will just add the plus one and push it. And then it turns out that that plus one that you added had unintended consequences and uh, you went from some users seeing a problem to all users seeing the problem because you didn't realize. So rollback first, fix later, even if it's tempting to hot fix. And then also have a process for the, like a meta process for handling the incidents, like who's going to communicate with the customers, who's going to escalate, uh, who's going to write the postmortem, whatever. But to have this meta process, again, because when you're in, in a very stressful situation, it's really hard to think on your feet. So the most things that you can just follow from a checklist, the better. All right, and I mentioned postmortems and that's our next slide. 
uh, postmortems, uh, also called by some people root cause analysis, are documents that explain what happened, uh, what happened before the outage, what happened during the outage, how it got fixed, who did what and why, etc. But it's important that none of this is bl blaming people. So postmortems should be blameless. Um, even if you say Marga did this, like Marga ran this command, it shouldn't be Marga is stupid and run this command, it should just be Marga ran this command. And it's important that we remember that whatever mistakes were made, even if a human made a mistake, the problem lies in the system, the system that allowed the human to make that mistake, right? Because we are all trying to do the best we can and if the system allows us to do things that are wrong, the system is at fault, not the humans. <laughs> because humans will make mistakes. We need to engineer a system that will not let those mistakes uh, cause outages. And so the, the goal of the postmortems is to learn from all of this, not to blame anybody, and to list the action items that will help us prevent the outages from happening in the future. And it's important to follow up on these action items because it's no use listing all the things you need to do if you then don't do them and then next month you have an outage exactly like the one you had before. All right, next slide. We're almost at the end. <laughs> all right, so uh, I've given similar versions of this talk before and usually when I get to this point, people are very anxious because they feel like there's a lot of information and they don't know where to start. So let's look into how you can get started. Next slide. Yeah. All right. So the first step, and this is like, it has to be the first step, is to monitor your service. If you don't have monitoring, you need to deploy monitoring. And as I said, it doesn't need to be Prometheus. It can be something simple. It doesn't need to be self-hosted. You can delegate to someone else, but you need to have monitoring because without relevant metrics of how your service is doing, you have no idea of what you need to do and, and how your application is behaving. Once you have monitoring, you can start doing all the fancy things like establishing SLOs and seeing how you're doing with those SLOs. So set the SLOs and then look at them in a month or a quarter and check if you are meeting them or not and what you need to do to fix that. And the same with alerts, you can set up alerts and then tune them. Setting up alerts will, will require time with fixing and, and checking that you're setting the right alerts, but it's better to have some alerts than none. So start small and then grow. And then as you start getting this information from your monitoring, your SLOs, your alerts, you can decide to invest time in testing and automation as needed, right? And as I said, it doesn't make sense to try to aim to 100% reliability. Uh, invest as much as it makes sense for your service. And finally, have a plan for outages and learn from the mistakes that you make. Uh, mistakes are really valuable in helping us uh, deploy better services. So make sure that you don't just like paper over them, but that you spend the time uh, to learn from them. All right, uh, that's it. We have a question slide. Yeah, and hopefully there are questions now. Um, yeah, anybody can okay. unmute themselves. Oh, great. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I found it very interesting. Um, I just would like to ask something. Maybe you share some ideas uh, to this uh, side of the problem. So in my case, uh, I come from operation team point of view. We have a lot of the things that you have mentioned, like metrics, alerting, uh, SLO. We do post-mortem and many teams uh, also support us from the development team. Of course, we cannot do this on our own. Uh, so many of our applications already support this, but I still find it sometimes not so easy to kind of convince developers why this is important. So any ideas on this side? Like we don't, to be, to be fair, we don't uh, do this error budgeting yet. We are thinking about it and this might be maybe something. 
Well, yeah, that might be something that you can introduce to developers and maybe have uh, a way that developers can visualize. Like if you say you already have all this monitoring and SLOs, et cetera, maybe have something simple where developers can see uh, the results of their work. So like if, if the service is down, if there are too many errors, uh, whatever the, the problems that uh, arise from uh, from bad features, whatever, uh, if it's visible, it's easier to, to communicate and to, to send the message. And in the end, it, it does, uh, I understand the struggle. Uh, for me, I think it helps to see it from the user's point of view. So developers will want to put out features because users want features but then they also want the application to work so that users keep using it, right? So like if at some point it's, it's getting so bad that the users are experiencing pain, then like developers will not want that, right? So like maybe try to uh, send the message from that part, that point of view of like users are not happy uh, with the service being down all the time or with it crashing or with half of the request uh, returning errors or whatever issues your application is seeing. <laughs>